Hello and welcome. This is the newsroom for today, Monday, January 4, 2020. We're broadcasting to you on E1, SCAR TV, NTN, and Tarsi TV in Bartica. In the headlines, no bills or invoices for 2020 elections cases can be found at the Attorney General's chambers. President Irfan Ali says his government will maintain a steady pace this year to ensure the country recovers from COVID-19. Opportunities will be created to join in such work and they will be made available to all. Cash grants, including for COVID-19 relief and public sector bonuses, will add up to $10 billion. And in sport, the sport minister impressed by the quality of play at historic Bounce Back Football Classic. With the news, I'm Neil Marks. We're glad you could join us. We begin with COVID-19. The Ministry of Health has isolated some students who tested positive for COVID-19 at the start of the school term on Monday. Health Minister Dr. Frank Anthony said testing, which started at the weekend, is still ongoing and therefore he could not give a specific number of cases on Monday during a briefing. The minister previously announced that all students who will be returning to the dorms have to undergo a COVID-19 test. Well, we, in the last year, mm -hmm. uh, we start collaborating with the Ministry of Education because we recognize that students would be coming out uh, today to school. And therefore, we want to ensure that the school environment would be safe for them. And uh, we started a program whereby as persons, the students come into the school, these dorm schools, that we will be able to test them. We deploy both our antigen uh, rapid tests to these areas as well as PCR testing. So all the students who would come back uh, to the dorms would be tested and um, we'll then be able to assure the Ministry of Education that they have a very safe environment. So far, over the last uh, couple of days of testing, we did find a number of students who are positive and those have been isolated. Uh, isolation, generally these students are all uh, asymptomatic, meaning they have no signs or symptoms of the disease. But nevertheless, we have to isolate them because if we put them with the general population of students, then they are going to spread it. So isolation would, would be required that they stay by themselves. Um, in a separate room, they'll be given food and education materials so that they can continue their learning and so forth. But they'll have to remain there for at least 10 days. If, however, they do exhibit some signs and symptoms, well, then those would be treated and would be monitored. And um, once they uh, stop getting any signs and symptoms, then we'll follow the protocol to uh, release them from isolation. So it's an ongoing process. Okay. Minister, you said a number of students. We didn't give a specific number. Do you have to offer Well, it's still an ongoing exercise, and we haven't uh, totaled the, the amount as yet. We expect that there will be quite a few, because with every one of the, the dorms, people are coming from different areas, and therefore we'll have to keep monitoring it. Okay. Meanwhile, the National Task Force of some 20 persons, which was set out to prepare for the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine in Guyana, will begin stringent work this week, according to the Health Minister. During Monday's COVID-19 update, he noted that Guyana will approve vaccines authorized by the United Kingdom, Canada and Australia. Reports are that Guyana will receive its first batch of COVID-19 vaccine in the second quarter of this year. Uh, we, our process is really a, a simple one. Once a vaccine has been approved uh, by the WHO, then we would accept uh, that approval because it, it meant that the vaccine would have undergone a rigorous set of evaluation. There are also what is called stringent regulatory authorities. And so in the US, they have a stringent regulatory authority, meaning that they would take whatever product through all its spaces and in interrogate it and make sure that it's safe for human uh, consumption or human uh, use. And um, in, in these instances, you have the US, FDA, you have the Canadians, UK, EU, Australia. Uh, these countries, if we 
uh, see products that have been authorized from these countries, we generally accept them because they are part of this network of being a stringent regulatory authority. So um, that's how we, we would normally approach it. Okay, nice, sir. Well, we'll start working on that now. Uh, we have at least about, uh, I think, 20 persons who are on the task force. And they come from various backgrounds and skill set. Uh, we want to make sure that we are prepared for the rollout of vaccines. So they'll be looking at our preparedness, working on a vaccine preparedness plan, working on a rollout plan. And then, of course, uh, making sure that all the sites where we'll be doing vaccines would be ready and so forth. So that's the kind of work that the oversight committee would have to make sure that all the elements uh, regarding um, the use of vaccines would be put in place. I would imagine that from the National Task Force, we'll have several subcommittees who would be um, doing you know, specific things. So it would, it would be an ongoing um, work, and that work starts from uh, this week. The Minister of Housing and Water, Central Housing and Planning Authority will on January 12th and 13th open bids for works in 18 housing projects across four regions. Region 3 residents can look forward to developments in Matamerzorg, Stewartville, Anna Katrina, Ellingburg and Cornelia Ida on the west coast of Devorara. In Region 4, the developments will take place in Prospect, Providence, Little Diamond and Great Diamond on the east bank of Devorara and Cummings Lodge, Monrepo, Annandale, Le Bon Intention, Vigilance, Bladen Hall and Stratsway on the east coast of Demerara. Meanwhile, in Regions 5 and 6, works are slated for Experiment, Hampshire, Williamsburg, number 75 and 79 villages, Ordnance, Fortlands and Kanji. Tenders for Region 4 open on January 12, while those for Regions 3, 5 and 6 open on January 13. More news after the break. You're watching the newsroom. With a police investigation imminent into the hefty sums the former coalition administration paid on legal fees through a process that breached the country's procurement laws, fresh revelations are that bills and invoices for a number of cases linked to the 2020 elections cannot be found. Kurt Campbell reports. Police investigators have been asked by Auditor General Diodat Sharma to probe the hefty spending in legal fees and private lawyers by the former AP and UAFC administration in a series of political cases. But that may prove to be an uphill task with no paper trail left at the Attorney General Chambers for several cases that were mounted following the March 2, 2020 elections. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Senior Counsel Anil Nandlal made the disclosure on Monday, one day after it was made public that the Auditor General had asked the police to conduct an in-depth investigation and institute charges where necessary for a series of procurement breaches. Nadla said for the period between March to August 2020, when the AP and UAFC and its supporters mounted a series of court battles to stave off its exit from government, no bills or invoices can be found. What has been revealed publicly is for 2019 to 2015. 2020, we can find no invoices, we can find no retention contract, we can find no invoices of payments being made. I refuse to believe that all these lawyers, both in Guyana and across the Caribbean, offer their services pro bono. They must have been paid. And one is now left to speculate how those payments were made, through what agency they to what agency were they made and who paid them. He described the situation as incestuous and said the police will now have to decide how they will go about investigating in the absence of important materials. The Attorney General suggested that the lawyers may have to be contacted individually and interrogated. Speaking generally in the Auditor General's report into the former government's legal fees of over $170 million between 2015 and 2020 and a series of breaches in the procurement of external lawyers, Nandla said it was not an isolated incident of corruption. This is taxpayers' dollars we are speaking about. They must at least, at a minimum, be some form of accountability. 
we can find nothing in this building. Uh, that's one of the first things I requested when I assumed the office. To look at the bills from March 22nd to August, 20, uh, August 2nd. And nothing can be found. So that is another mystery. The Attorney General said following the revelations in the Auditor General's report, Cabinet will have to meet and decide on how it addresses the situation before moving forward. Nandlal also pointed out that the majority of the political cases were lost by the then government. He said the taxpayers' funded cases benefited them nothing. In the audit report, it was found that in many instances the contracts were entered into with the attorneys, but the posts were never publicly advertised. With many of the cases dating back to the no-confidence motion, this resulted in a breach of the Procurement Act. In addition to the police probe, the Auditor General said disciplinary action should be taken against those culpable of breaching the Procurement Act, and the Ministry must ensure there is full compliance with the Procurement Act with respect to the awarding of contracts. Atlantic Fuels Incorporated Director Eugene Gilbert was on Monday released on bail of $300,000 in relation to a charge which claimed that the fuel company made a false declaration for the Guyana Revenue Authority on a customs invoice. Gilbert, 67, appeared before Magistrate Sherdell Isaacs Marcus at the Georgetown Magistrates Court on Monday and denied that on November 12, 2020, he caused to be made a false declaration on an invoice for $100,000 at the GRA headquarters in Georgetown. In December last, Commissioner General Godfrey Stacia instituted legal proceedings against the fuel company. Atlantic Fuel Inc. was granted fuel import storage and wholesale licenses in November 2015, months after the former coalition government went into office. Directors of the company are former Chief Executive Office of the Ghana Water Incorporated, Dr. Richard Van West Charles, former Debt Recovery Unit Manager at GWI, Lear Goring, and Anjan and Ronaldo Alfonso. Dr. Ashni Singh, Senior Minister within the Office of the President with Responsibility for Finance, has been speaking about the impact of the cash grants handed out by the government. When added up with the COVID-19 relief grant to all households in the country, the two weeks bonus to the disciplined services and frontline workers, and the $25,000 cash grant to public servants, the government payout amounts to over $10 billion. This grant is being paid by government in recognition of the hardships that have been faced in the very challenging circumstances that have surrounded the daily existence uh, of the not only employees of the public sector but indeed of their families and the wider public at large. I might in fact also add that the payment of this one-off grant to public sector employees has to be viewed alongside with government's many other initiatives uh, designed to bring relief to frontline workers and to households across Guyana. Considering that this will put $2 billion of additional disposable income in the hands of employees of the public sector, they will in turn spend this, consume this disposable income by spending it in the markets, in the shops, and in the businesses throughout the length and breadth of, of our country. That therefore generates economic activity and in turn will multiply itself many times over across the economy. Dr. Singh pointed out also that together with the cash grants, the other measures implemented by the government since it took up office on August 2nd last was intended to jumpstart the economy, which had been battered not only by COVID-19, but by a protracted electoral process, which began with the passage of the no confidence motion. Dr. Singh spoke particularly about how the passage of the motion on December 21st, 2018 affected the economy. The private sector and the business community adopted an extreme and ultra cautious stance with respect to their investment and with respect to their expansion and their operations. Households also adopted an ultra-cautious stance, being uncertain of what the future held, being uncertain of what you know, you know, the security of um, you know, businesses, lots of businesses started to contract, started to lay off people, uh, household income uh, came under threat as a result of which householders adopted a very conservative and a very ultra-cautious stance. And so this in turn fed into a very, very uh, difficult period for the economy. 
And then, of course, COVID happened as well. And so on top of the political challenges, there was COVID. And together, the effect on the economy was really devastating. I mean, many, I don't think I, I don't think, I don't think there's anybody in Guyana who is not aware of the devastating impact that the political situation and that COVID-19 had on the economy as a whole. And so we recognized, as soon as we came into government, we recognized the importance of restarting the economy, re-injecting, re um, first of all, in the, in the immediate term, re-injecting disposable income uh, to restart consumption, household consumption, and to restart economic activity, but also taking the steps that are necessary to, to, to rebuild private sector confidence, to restore um, and rebuild uh, and stre further strengthen private sector confidence going forward because that's essential to investment and creation of jobs and generation of incomes. So I thought I would give that elaboration really to situate this initiative in the broader context of uh, the focus of our government. Uh, both in terms of the immediate response, but also in terms of what can be expected going forward. As workers across the private and public sector return to work on Monday for the new year, President Irfan Ali has said 2021 will be the springboard from which the country will leap into recovery, rebuilding the economy, enhancing people's health and lifting up the vulnerable in society. He said the government will identify those communities, assess their needs, identify solutions and implement plans to change their circumstances. President Ali said this will not happen overnight, but he intends to initi initiate that first step and to maintain a steady pace in the work of the government. The year 2021 will be the springboard from which our nation will leap into recovery, rebuilding our economy, enhancing our people's health, and lifting up the vulnerable in our society. We must not remain a rich country of poor people. The bounty of our nation must be shared across our population. The standard of living and the quality of life must be lifted for all. Work will be rewarded. Hard work will be rewarded even more. Opportunities will be created to join in such work and they will be made available to all. I recognize that there are communities within our society who because of disadvantages of geographic location will need more help than others to join our national advance. We will identify those communities, assess their needs, identify solutions, and implement plans to change their circumstances. This change will not occur overnight. It will take time. But every journey begins with the first step. I intend to initiate the first step and to maintain a steady pace that will take us to the journey's end. More news ahead, stay with us. You're watching the newsroom. Caribbean Motor Spirits, which was founded in 2012, has opened a branch at Grove on the east bank of Demerara and intends to open another in Georgetown by the end of the month. The fact that this is happening during the pandemic has been hailed by the business chamber and government officials. Though in business for just eight years, it is today one of the leading importers, distributors, wholesaler and retailer of auto parts in Guyana. The Grove branch was opened on Saturday last. We are a dedicated team supplying a wide range of quality automotive parts from auto parts manufacturers worldwide in order to satisfy the needs of all Japanese, Korean, U.S. model, uh, U.S. made vehicle owners. We stock a wide variety, a wide inventory of automotive lubricants, batteries, car care products, air conditioning products, uh, suspension and engine parts. And we are representatives of several worldwide known brands such as GSP, JHF, Johnson, Platin, Tenacity, Eagle Eye Lighting, Freestone, Syntec, to, to list a few. We must earn our customers' trust, loyalty, by providing superior customer service along with quality products as we continuously aim for sustained growth. Caribbean Motor Spares has customers in all regions of Guyana, and it is our objective to ensure the continuous importation and distribution, uh, distribution of high-quality products for the ever-evolving Guyanese market. 
and our awesome and valued customers. In this, in this way, we contribute to keeping the wheels of our economy turning ever safer and faster. The fact that he is doing expansion of his enterprise during a time of a global pandemic speaks to not only the systems that he has in place and his vision, uh, but also the way that he is able to streamline his enterprise. And Mr. Dubé, I would like to, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, congratulate you on this expansion in your business. I'd also like to say uh, to you that it is very, very admirable that you continue to drive business growth, business development, um, and you seek to set a new standard here in Guyana, um, in your industry. Every time a business expands into a different community, it breathes life into that new community. It assists with the development of that community. And I know him being the person he is, he will make sure that this area, Grove area, benefit from this business. Everybody is sure where Guyana is going now. We are confident in the direction and what people do, business people do on a daily basis and invest and expand is a testament that they are with that direction that the country is going in and they are investing in the future of Guyana. And again, this is a testament to that. And I just want to um, charge uh, Mr. Dubé with uh, two things. Um, one is to always be conscious um, of your corporate social responsibility. Um, it's always important um, to give back. It's always important um, to ensure that you that you show gratitude um, and and you know pay it forward, as they say, as you go forward. It is important um, in the universe. You know, it's important that you you put that good effort out there, that you put that good energy out there. For those who are not religious. You know, it's important that you put that out there. The more you give, the more it comes back to you. And also to remember that your staff and your team here um, is part of your success. And they will continue to be part of your success. They can make or break you. And, you know, every chance I get, I always compliment the staff at the Ministry of Housing and Water too, because we would be nothing without them. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport. Welcome back to Newsroom. My name is Avanar Framzan. All the best for 2021. Now for a look at what's happening in sport, we're starting off with some football news. A second-half goal from Kelsey Benjamin handed Georgetown All-Stars the bounce-back football classic title on Friday evening at the National Stadium Providence. More in this report. In a clash involving two teams with a long history of rivalry, Georgetown All-Stars needed just a solitary goal to prevail over Linden All-Stars in the Kashyap and Shanghai organized four-team two-day tournament. After a goalless opening half, Benjamin found the back of the net in the 69th minute to ensure the City lads would be the ones smiling when the final whistle was blown. For the win, Georgetown All-Stars copped the championship trophy and $1 million, while Linden had to settle for the runners-up prize of $500,000. On the opening day on Tuesday at the same venue, Linden All-Stars defeated East Coast All-Stars 4-2 and Georgetown All-Stars got the better of West Side All-Stars 3-2. The matches signal the commencement of competitive action after nine months of inactivity due to COVID-19. All players were tested for COVID-19 prior to the event. The final was streamed live on NCN Channel 11, E-Networks, AJTV and the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sports Facebook page. The tournament received corporate backing from KFC Guyana, Ground Structures Engineering Consultants, the Trophy Stall, Mohammed's Enterprise, ExxonMobil and Tiger Rentals. Meanwhile, the sport minister Charles Ramson Jr. said he was impressed by the quality of play in what he deemed a historic return of competitive football in Guyana. Ramson's ministry had teamed up with the Kashyap and Shanghai organization and the Guyana Football Federation to stage the Bounce Back Football Classic, a four-team, two-day tournament that ended on New Year's Day with Georgetown All-Stars pipping Linden All-Stars 1-0 in the final. First of all, I'm very pleased to be um, creating history here. This is a historic event for several reasons. One is that we are able to do this safely during a pandemic. 
recognizing that this is this pandemic is a challenge, it forced us to think laterally, forced us to innovate. When we started to examine our options, it was important that when we have the product of broadcasting, that it must be of a high standard. The people who are looking at home and the people who are looking on, on the internet, all across the world actually, they are able to see that Guyana is producing something of a very high standard. That's something that all Guyanese should feel proud about. The second is, in relation to the quality of the football, it was impressive. Impressive, especially when you consider the circumstances. The circumstances have been severe because when anyone knows who plays sports, if you don't get that constant practice, you, you, start, losing your, you start losing your touch. These guys have come out here and show, they've shown that they are at a good level to be able to progress quickly. At least that is, would be the hope because they have qualifiers in March, uh, World Cup qualifiers in March. Um, importantly as well, that we're in doing this, we have been able to provide the platform for a lot of the young talent to get exposure exposure that is being delivered all across the country but also further afield because there are many persons who are going to be recruiting players in other parts of the world that they will be able to use this as a, a premium example to say this is what has happened on this day and these are the types of players that we had and some of the individual players will be able to use that as a platform to be able to sell themselves. We're also setting an example because now using this precedent, we've got to now further that. I'm happy as well that the Guyana Football Federation uh, and the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sport on behalf of the government of Guyana, we've been able to form a strong partnership. A partnership that already sends a signal that we will be able to um, aggressively advance the program and ov the overall responsibility that we are respectively charged with. Student Football University of Guyana student Jafar Gibbons and his organizing team are hoping that they can be granted a necessary approval by the relevant authorities to host the third edition of the King of Studies football tournament in April. Gibbons spoke to Akim Green on Monday. The university is currently conducting online classes as against in-class sessions due to the pandemic. According to Gibbons, apart from firstly, getting all the necessary approval, depending on whether the institution decides to return to in-person tutoring, will also depend on whether they host it at a Turkey campus. We don't want to start at the university as we given their consent as yet, because we don't want to put the lives of the students at risk. So, of course, we're going to have to get the National Task Force um, in, in play. We're going to have to speak with those operators at the university to get the necessary approval. But all things remaining equal, uh, I'm even eyeing using the national gymnasium. Hence why we have to wait on all these things to open up. Because what we want to do, we want to keep it in a safe environment and in a controlled environment compared to what it used to be at the university, which is kind of open. He indicated last year approximately 150 student athletes took part in the form of officials and players. And he hopes more can increase this year. This year, what we want to do is we want to add the goalkeeping feature to the to the tournament. So we're going to use the big size goal instead of the small size goal, which is um the, one of the reasons why we're eyeing the use of the national gymnasium. If uh, all things remain equal, if we get those permission working along with the ministry and the university at large, the tournament usually caters for about 120 student athletes. Uh, 110, 100 would usually be players, and then you would have like table officials, persons working in marketing of the tournament, etc. So we end up using about 150 student athletes. So for this year, what we want to do is take that number up to about 160, 170. So we're getting more persons involved. You know, the tournament is exciting. We want to put, we want it to be a three-a-side tournament with one goalie. So it's three out three players. So those are some exciting things to look forward in the tournament. And we're still going to keep our fastball rules. 
where you know a goal is awarded double a goal is two goals is recorded for every goal scored with a minute remaining in the in the half with two minutes remaining in the half sorry in some of the top universities the participation in sport counts as a point towards a student's grade point average and Gibbons who also holds the position as president of the University of Ghana Student Society says it is something they can implement in the near future. As you rightfully said, this is the way of the modern university. Sports is not an uh, sports is not a hobby anymore. Sports is actually a business, and you're actually right. Playing sports should come towards a GP or should be put there because it is not looked as a hobby. It it helps propels the university forward. You know. Students in, in various tournaments in university can represent the university at large, giving them a great boost winning international tournaments. I can remember a few years ago, the university's basketball team won a, a Caribbean championship. So you don't want to have all those efforts and energies exerted only for a trophy or a medal. Not saying those things are not good, but if you're going to represent the university, it should be reflected in your formal profile. And I think to some degree it does. I think to some degree if you participate as part of the university sporting team, it does come. But like you rightfully said, you know, playing in a tournament don't really give you that extra point. But it is something that it is something that we are looking to to achieve down the line. Could be this year, could be the following. He expressed thanks for the continued support of CNL Construction, the Kashi and Shanghai organization, Robbie Rambaran, the Ghana Football Federation, along with the University of Guyana and a student society. The prize money is expected to remain the same with $100,000 for first prize, while second and third will cop $50,000 and $25,000 respectively. 10% of all winnings will go towards a project at the university by the teams. For the newsroom, Mark in Green. Now, the Bangladesh Cricket Board has named Shakib Al Hassan in both the preliminary test and ODI squads to face West Indies in three ODIs and two test matches between January 10 and February 15. Shakib is back in the national reckoning after his one year ban for not reporting a corrupt approach. He was Bangladesh Test and T20 captain before the ban, but now returns as an ordinary member of the side. Shakib recently returned to competitive action, playing in the Bangladesh domestic T20 tournament, making 110 runs and taking six wickets in nine games. The series would be Bangladesh's first international outing since the COVID-19 pandemic stopped cricket in the country in mid-March. There have been two domestic tournaments, but a number of home series and away tours have been postponed. Last month, West Indies agreed for this shortened tour. Close to the home now, as the Ghana Jaguars commence preparations in early 2021 for the regional Super 50 in February, Cricket Guyana Inc. has named two squads to play in three practice games on January 8, 10 and 12. The teams would be led by batsmen Shimron Hetmeyer and Leon Johnson. Matches are slated for the LBI ground on the east coast of Demerara, beginning nine hours on each day. According to CGI, all players named in the two squads are required to participate in a fitness assessment, which was originally scheduled for January 4 from six hours at the National Track and Field Centre at Lenora on the west coast of Demerara. However, that assessment has been shifted to another date to be confirmed. Hetmeyer's team will come from Chandapal Hemraj, Raymond Perez, Kevlon Anderson, Shimron Hetmeyer, Shofain Rutherford, Akshaya Prasad, Kimal Savory, Bashkar Yadram, Kevin Sinclair, Dimitri Cameron, Keon Joseph, Clinton Pastano, Anthony Adams, Vishal Singh, Mahindra Dindial, Stephen Sankar, Sachin Singh and Ricardo Adams. Johnson's team would come from Trevon Griffith, Tevin Imlak, Leon Johnson, Jonathan Fu, Christopher Barnwell, Asset Fudadin, Anthony Bramble, Quinton Sampson, Gudakesh Moti, Ramal Lewis, Niall Smith, Ronaldo Ali Mohammed, Tej Narayan Chandapal, Devendra Bishu, Andre Stull, Totaram Bishon, Richie Loknot, and Kelvin Omrao. Romario Shepard, Versami Pramal, and Ramon Rifa will be on West Indies duties, while Kimo Paul will be otherwise engaged in cricket duties, CGI noted. Now, Kane Williamson proved why he's currently the top-ranked test batsman with a brilliant 112 not out to keep New Zealand on course for a handy first innings lead against Pakistan in the second and final test in Christchurch on Monday. Williams' burgeoning 215-run stand with Henry Nichols, unbeaten on 89, helped the hosts finish, the day, finish day two strong on 286 for three in reply to Pakistan's first innings total of 297. New Zealand are currently 1-0 up in the series and need only a draw to rise to the top of the world rankings for the first time. Earlier openers Tom Brundle with 16 and Tom Latham 33 
fell in successive overs while Ross Taylor departed early after making 12 at the Higley Oval. And crowd capacity for the third test between Australia and India at the Sydney Cricket Ground has been reduced to 25% after a COVID-19 outbreak. A pre-Christmas surge of the virus in Sydney led to calls to ban spectators, but tickets will be reissued on the new social distancing guidelines. The stadium can seat 48,000 people and the original intention had been for it to be filled to 50% of capacity. The four-match series is level at one all. The third test starts on January 7. Both teams were set to arrive in Sydney on Monday. India's players and staff have, tef have tested negative for the virus after five cricketers were placed in isolation. The five players were isolated as a precaution after they were videoed eating indoors at a Melbourne restaurant, which is not allowed under the biosecure rules. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. Of course, you can find updates on these and other stories on our website, newsroom.gy, our Facebook page and Instagram. On behalf of the entire news team, my name is Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching. Be safe. See you next time.